Hey everyone, I'm Brian Barletta from Sounds Profitable, and we're here to talk about business models and podcasting. Um, before I pass it off to everybody here, uh, Sounds Profitable is an advisory service that's focused on growing revenue and audiences for podcasting. And I'm really excited to speak to all of you because podcasting is near and dear to my heart. And I think that there is a lot that we can learn from it and a lot that podcasting can learn from radio too. So we have three guests up here. Each of them are going to talk a little bit about their business model uh, and the monetization options they have. Then we're going to turn to some questions that I have for them. And I think pretty early on, we're going to pass it off to some of you to ask questions too. So as you're going through everything, as you're listening in, if you have ideas, if you have questions, please write them down because we'd really like to hear from you. So we're going to go through and we're going to introduce um, Everybody one at a time, we have uh, Rebecca Has, SVP of Sponsorship at New York Public Radio, uh, which is really cool because uh, Rebecca and, and uh, New York Public Radio is uh, one of the first companies that really worked in attribution in podcasting uh, with progressive auto insurance. They really pushed that uh, and pushed my limits <laughs> into what we could do in the space and really drove that forward. We have Rob Greenlee, VP Podcast Content and Partnerships at Libsyn, one of the oldest podcast hosting companies, and mm -hmm. recently with their uh, acquisition of AdvertiseCast has become a major powerhouse in monetization in podcasting. It's been a really impressive transformation. Mm -hmm. And we have Nic uh, Nicolaj Kopel, uh, co-founder and director of content at Podimo, who has really been taking the world by storm and growth from content and everything that you guys have been digging into. And I'm actually really excited because Nicolaj has got a presentation for us to walk through their model. So I'm going to pass it off to Rob Greenlee first. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. It's great to be here um, in, in Sweden. Um, but uh, yeah, as far as business models with uh, 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 Lipson, it's been a, a whirlwind of the last year, us, us acquiring companies like it the advertised cast platform, like Brian mentioned, um, where we're monetizing about 2,500 plus uh, podcasts uh, with advertising. Um, but that's just one piece of Lipson, and I just wanted to say um, that you know most of our podcasters don't do advertising. So back when we started uh, as a podcast host in 2004, which was the first podcast host to ever exist, um, Podcasting, advertising wasn't something that um, really was done often and was not highly looked upon. So, so when we started, it really wasn't the, the company as monetization. It was really given, giving people a voice. Um, and then over time, you know, branded podcasts have developed and paid subscription models have developed and, and the advertising models have um, have kind of taken over the, the limelight. And so we've also acquired uh, a company called Glow that basically um, takes care of the premium paid subscription podcasting side and we've done deals with Spotify to get um, content that's hosted on our platform into Spotify to offer a paid, paid subscription model. Um, so, so we are now kind of a full featured business model um, option for podcasters now from s sponsorship to advertising to paid premium um, to to just if you want to do um, you know like a, a branded podcast where you're promoting your product or service or whatever which is a big component of podcasting so um, so that's that's yeah. my story I think that's really cool because it means that you have your hands on every aspect of podcasting so podcasting right now is such a big word Right? This right here, if we turn this into audio format, or even if it's in video, it can be a podcast. Right, We're consuming audio, we're learning from it, we're enjoying it or being entertained from it. But then you have the core podcasters, the daily, these shows that serial, the ones that stick with us that are going to be institutions in the space, WMYC, plenty of shows there. And then we have Hollywood productions, we have like the big budget <laughs> ones. And that means that everything from what we could turn this into right here to enterprises in this space using the different tools and the monetization aspects, Libsyn gets to interact with all of them and hear a little bit about each of them. And so, Rebecca, let's, let's hear from a publisher side. 
Yeah, so publisher side, not just any publisher, you know, nonprofit publisher um, in the U.S., um, one of the largest, if not the largest, um, radio, public media radio brands in the country, New York Public Radio, where we have multi-platform, WNYC, WQXR, um, both, ter both terrestrially and digital streaming, WNYC Studios. I'm an early entrant in the podcast market. Um, radio Lab, our biggest show, is celebrating 20 years this year, which is incredibly exciting. Um, and then we also have Gothamist, which is a website uh, mainly based on in New York. So we kind of dip our toes in every single possible way to make money. We're a nonprofit. Um, that doesn't mean we're not trying to make money. We are just trying to make sure that the money we do make is reinvested right back into the incredible premium content that we produce. Um, we do sponsorship, which is what I'm responsible for. Um, in podcasting, that basically means advertising a little bit light, meaning we're not overly commercial. We really care about the listener experience. We don't have um, too much ad load, but we have enough ad load to drive a very fast-growing podcast advertising business. Um, we also have a membership model, um, members, individual community members who just donate money to, the, to our um, various shows and to us overall. We get foundation grants, which is another way to make money, which only really nonprofits can do. And when you're talking about local journalism in particular, the nonprofit model, at least in the U.S., is probably um, long-term the most sustainable model. Um, and then we also have um, distribution and licensing um, rights to our content so we can make money that way. From a sponsorship perspective, coming out of the pandemic, um, and I'm not sure if I should even say that. <laughs> I hope we're coming out of the pandemic. Um, let's keep our fingers and toes crossed. Um, my team is leading um, the strongest rebound in the United States in terms of post-pandemic um, sponsorship revenue performance um, versus other public media benchmarking. We're up 50% year over year. We're having our best fiscal year since 2019. Um, and we're also over-indexing some commercial um, competitors too, like iHeart or Amazon Advertising. We're just having a really great year. We're optimizing in every way we possibly can. And in a business like podcasting, which is growing incredibly fast, um, it's growing because of mass and because of scale, not necessarily because of premium content, highly reported content, um, highly researched content, which is what WNYC Studios is really known for. So um, it's enab it enables us to kind of get more premium um, sponsors and premium CPMs and higher engagement from our listeners because they actually hear the spots. So it's a really cool space. Before this, I was in the newspaper business, so I'm a newspaper refugee. Um, anyone in the radio business, from my perspective, radio is in no way in decline. If you want to look at a business that's a little bit in decline, look at print. <laughs> radio is very much alive and well, um, and podcast is just kind of turbocharged. So there's just a lot of opportunity in the audio space in general that I think we should all just be really excited about. And I'm really excited to have you up here because with all those examples you listed out, you're able to explore all those monetization options at a, a very like institutionalized level. Like there are other ways to try it at like more entry level, but you're being able to try them out at scale really aggressively. And that's pretty cool. It's really cool. Yeah. We can, yeah, we can do a lot of, I mean, one of the reasons, one of the things that drew me to New York Public Radio is because we have this premium content, we have phenomenal reach, at least, you know, um, we have 21 million downloads a month on, on our podcast. Yeah, just a few. Um, people really love us. People love our tote bags. You know, so it's just <laughs> a great place to be. Um, and it's yeah. a great place to be able to experiment, too, with, you know, incredible content that wins awards. And I'm not trying to pitch. It's just I'm really <laughs> excited about working, well, good. working there. I think that's I think that's a big part about None podcasts. of you. I don't think any of you are advertisers. I'm just excited. So <laughs> you're not my clients necessarily. <laughs> and Nikolaj, I'd love to, to give the floor to you for a bit to, to talk about Podimo and yep. to do your presentation. And then I have a bunch of questions for you as well. Good. And um, I might just start off by saying that I haven't been to Radio Days Europe for eight or nine years. And back then, everyone had slides. So <laughs> this weekend, wow, I'm going to Radio Days. I thought, I need slides. So I made slides. I need to uh, go up here and... and um, <laughs> And present you for it. And also because, I mean, we've only existed, Podimo has only existed for like two and a half years. So we get a lot of questions all the time, probably some of the same questions that you might have and maybe even you guys. Um, and in order to get to the point, I did this presentation. So we might be able to skip some of the questions. For instance, how do you pronounce your name, Podimo? 
first question <laughs> answered. Okay. So, um, who are we? What do we do? And and uh, what is the what is the picture um, seen from above? My name is Nikolai Koppel, as you just said. Um, I'm happy to be here. Um, first of all, um, well, we are, we think we are, uh, the largest podcast subscription service in Europe. Uh, we're about two and a half years old. We launched in Denmark uh, back in September 2019. And um, now we're in Denmark. We opened in Germany a couple of months later. Um, we went on to open up in Spain. Norway, um, the Netherlands recently, and by the way, also LATAM. And we're looking into further international expansion quite soon. So with a subscription to Podimo, users can listen to their favorite uh, podcast um, exclusively and without advertising uh, for about five euros per month, approximately five euros, depending on, on uh, the, uh, the market. Our platform offers a revenue model. Um, by sharing a portion of the revenue that we get with the podcasters. And I'll get back to that. After all, this is a revenue session. So I'll get back to that shortly. So let's just take a quick uh, step back. I don't think I'm surprising anyone in this room by saying that audio is on the rise. I think it's probably been said a thousand times already at, uh, at Radio Days um, within the last 24 hours. Um, and that goes both globally and locally. In Denmark, where we started out and where I come from, it's about 30% of the adult population which is listening to podcasts um, weekly. Um, so in terms of both um, uh, number of listeners and consumption volume, the numbers are ever increasing. That, of course, goes both locally and globally. When we started out uh, late 2019, there were about, what does it say, 275 million people um, podcast li listeners worldwide, as you can see here on the right. Um, that number is estimated to be almost doubled um, within the next one and a half years to more than half a billion people. Um, also, in terms of financials, the spoken word uh, audio market is believed to grow towards $50 billion by 2026, which is more than three times the estimated value last year. So, a lot is definitely going on. So, how it started, this was the development, all these big numbers and all this development going one way. Um, that was the massive rise of audio that we were tapping into back then in Podimo, back in September 2019, the guys on this photo. And when we weren't randomly hanging out on a sta staircase, we had an idea. And what was actually that idea back then? Um, well, it's pretty much the same as it is today. And it's two-sided so two towards one, the users, of course, and two, the creators. As to the users, well, uh, hundreds of thousands of subscribers so far have shown to like and, and be willing to pay for a subscription service um, for spoken word, word audio entertainment, which offers exclusive local productions. And what we want to do is create a seamless audio experience, creating a lot of reason to buy um, exclusive shows in each market, and at the same time, hopefully also solving some of the discovery and recommendation issues that a surprising uh, number of, of, uh, uh, of uh, platforms have had within uh, the, um, the last many years. Recently, we introduced uh, audiobooks as part of our offering, and we are uh, hopefully well on our way to creating a one-stop shop for spoken word audio, a service that, from a user point of view, can bridge the gap between podcasts on the one side, and audiobooks on the other. So, as to the creators, we are pouring millions of euros into creating a ton of exclusive audio content, and by doing so, of course, we are creating a lot of jobs, and at the same time, taking part of this overall professionalizing the industry. One of the th key things here, here is that we emphasize a lot on having local teams that work with, work with local podcasters, in each and every market that we're in. So, to the uh, monetization bit. Well, we offer more than just one path of monetization. Uh, first and foremost, we help creators monetize regardless of, of exclusivity. The key, the key here is that we are a subscription service that offers a 50% revenue share of its user payments with RSS creators. 
So even non-exclusive creators earn money in addition to what they might be earning from sponsors and from advertising. So again, we all know that the uh, audio market is growing at a rapid pace. Um, still, many creators are struggling to monetize their content in a meaningful way. For years, podcasting was built entirely on ad advertising. I think that the strengths and the limitations of that model have become evident for most people. It happens that even successful podcasts aren't necessarily earning the value that corresponds with their popularity. So one of the reasons that we created Podimo was to build an alternative model for podcasters that can deli deliver stable revenue and allows those who focus on podcasts to earn more than they earn from advertising without necessarily having to worry about the business of sponsorships. And here I should probably insert that um, some people might want to go left and go all RSS. Because for many creators, um, podcasting is part of a bigger picture. It might be a side hustle of some sorts and a way to build a brand or an audience or reach for other purposes. For these people, um, going ad-supported towards the RSS um, may make, make more sense than going the Podimo path. Our goal is to aggregate creators who benefit from our consumer-supported model and deliver a different kind of listening experience for our subscribers than a solely ad-supported model can provide. Just a very quick view on our top verticals. And uh, while you're taking a quick look at this, uh, which shows a bit about what we are focusing in on as of now, um, and the characteristics, the characteristics within, within each um, content vertical, probably not super surprising for the, uh, the researchers in the room. Um, also, having here a, a slide on our listeners, um, I'd like to finish off by saying, uh, which, by the way, shows that well, uh, not surprisingly, most users are somewhere in between 30-something uh, and 40-something years old, uh, female skewed, and our stats right now are somewhere in the region of five hours listening per week and five unique podcasts per month and 23 episodes. Um, but, of course, and that's probably also something that we're going to discuss in a minute, the audio market in general is so much expanding in so many different directions, also because the medium is itself is still developing. And just one word on the content itself. Let's face it, a lot of content within audio has not really been developed significantly within the last decade when it comes to formatting UX and etc. There are, of course, exceptions. But most content formats are still produced within the same four or five basic models over and over again. And I think, we think, there is a lot to come when it comes to innovating uh, the way in which we tell stories in audio. And we hope, and we believe, also as owners, as the user experience in the shape of our own platform, that it's possible to unlock different verticals and ways of consuming audio. We also believe that a unique uh, listening experience can unlock even more of audio's value, for instance, by building an app which is more than just a basic audio player. So during the next 12 months, I hope, and or even if I stand here in 12 months from now, I hope you've seen us experiment a lot with the app itself to deliver new audio formats um, to their fullest. But overall, we do believe that the development in the market will help the, grow the audio format even further, create more jobs, more innovation, etc and hopefully even more amazing content. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. And even, I think you added even more questions for me now. Sorry? You have yeah. even more questions? Yeah. Nice. Well, I like it. Let's, I mean, let's dig into the first one, subscription. I think subscription is such an interesting thing. I mean, first off, I, I want to say that when we're talking to a room full of audio people, I think we're going to cut off the bottom half um, I think it's very cool that there are a lot of cool creators out there building content that's inspiring for them, but I don't think today's the time we're going to talk about how they monetize, like under a couple hundred to a thousand downloads an episode. That's, a, that's another conversation that we can dig into when we talk about the people who are treating it as a business, growing and marketing it. That's the people that we're going to address here. So subscription, I think, Rebecca, you know, what is subscription like for your company? It's a good question. Um, from a digital subscription perspective, we kind of just started um, dipping our toe into the water. Um, 
with Radiolab, we have three different kind of subscription levels, but because we're a nonprofit, because ultimately we're a public good, we want to serve our community as best as possible, we would never fully cut off content to someone who doesn't want to pay for it directly, but um, subscribers get just, just some additional content or additional value um, while still being able to hear, um, you know, so the, the core part of the content that we put out. And is um, it ad free? Too, or? Yes, it's ad free. Now, is it sponsorship free? It's sponsorship gotcha. free. I like to differentiate ads and sponsorship <laughs> because I think to me, sponsorship is a model for the publisher. It says, I'm bringing you this value, let's be associated. It's similar to licensing, right? Where advertisement is a flat rate. You get this amount of impressions for this many dollars. And so it's really important to, to think through that. I think a lot of times people think that you can't have sponsored subscription content. You, but ad-free content seems to be the push. Now, there's so many different platforms, right? We have Podomo, we have Apple, we have Spotify, we have Glow, we have all of these options here. Do you, are you available through all of them? I believe so, but I'm not the expert on subscriptions. I'm the expert on sponsorship. <laughs> no, but to be, um, we definitely are available through Apple. Um, yeah. But yeah, but not as much through all the others, I don't think. And I think an important thing that I like to leave with everybody on that is that we think about the subscription model only as monetization sometimes, but Apple and Spotify and Podomo and Glow, this is a product that's valuable to them, so by participating in it and putting your marketing around it, they're going to co-market with you because it's beneficial to both sides. So don't think of it only as a revenue stream, but think of it as a chance to explore a different avenue of marketing when you try and figure out how you're gonna accompany those costs. So Rob, Glow is an acquisition, it's been a little over a year? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, what's different about Glow is that we are, we're providing a tool basically to content creators to, to um, publish their podcast um, into a paid subscription model that can be more open, can be available off of really any any listening platform. The the podcaster would get, um, or the subscriber would get a unique RSS feed to get access to the su subscription content. Plus we just did a deal with Spotify to get our Glow tool subscription into their interface. Um, so, so those subscriptions can pass through Spotify. Now, Apple is a separate situation. You sure upload is. directly to them. Uh, we don't have anything to do with Apple on that side. But, but you know, a a solution with Glow basically gives you access to um, all customers that want to listen to any any of these podcasts that are under a subscription in basically any podcast player that will enable you to cut and paste in an RSS feed. Um, so that's the that's the key difference. Though I do think that the future of this is integration into um, listening platforms. Um, so it's just a one-click thing. You you hit subscribe, and that's the relationship that we have with Spotify. So we, we're using the same technology. It's hosted on our platform. It just passes through our transaction engine into into sp through Spotify to listeners. So. Um, it's a it's a cost per transaction, and then a percentage on the um, the visa or yeah. the credit card transaction is the model. Um, but you can certainly, as a podcaster, you can put ads, host read ads, into your subscription model if you want to. It's totally up to the content creator. And it means it's similar to Patreon in the mindset that, you know, they're providing you a service, so they take their cut, and then there's the fee processing aspect of it. But you hit on something that is a pain point right now. All of these companies came to the space and said, we have subscription, and it means something different from all of them. Now, Spotify is allowing that integration. Apple is Apple. Um, and, and that might happen. The more requests that we make from them, uh, the more they listen, and that's been really interesting. But Nikolaj, with... With Podomo, can is there a future where from Glow I can push my podcast through, or is it do I have to separately upload a different file? No, no, no. Uh, I mean, Podomo comes in two versions. You yep. have the free version, and you have the, the exclusive paid version. And by uh, by subscribing to Podimo as a service, you mm -hmm. get, of course, access to all the original exclusive content, which is not on the free model. So we are, as many other platforms, scraping the RSS. 
And uh, if you claim your podcast, uh, which is very, very easy to do, you actually get 50% of the revenue uh, according to the um, user-centric model that we gotcha. the outcome. Yep. Now, if I want to add additional content uniquely in Podomo, can I do that? Not without contacting the local market. Okay, but that's not a bad yeah. thing. Yeah. But that, and that's something you're encouraging right now. Yeah. Awesome. We're, I mean, again, that I had a slide on it. That we, uh, we, we put a lot of emphasis on working locally, locally because that is going to be one of the, the um, hopefully one of the unfair advantages we can have. Because, I mean, we're tiny. We're still the small mouse it's towards Spotify and Apple. But operating locally and having um, an office in, the, uh, in Madrid, Barcelona, uh, in Denmark, in Copenhagen, in in uh, uh, Berlin and so forth, in all the markets that we're in, um, helps us to uh, build uh, uh, relationships with, with uh, both uh, well-known names and with uh, names that are totally new to podcasting. But, it, and, but I want to, like, that's the right way to go about it, and, and we need to think about this. We report so much on the U.S. because ad dollars are there, and as I meet more and more of you and talk about advertising, um, in the U.S. it seems pretty easy to just go up to advertisers and say, please spend with us. It seems very different outside the U.S. Uh, drastically. That model is important. We hit $1.4 billion in the U.S. spending last year in advertising, but the year before that, or, or 2019, it was 1.4 billion worldwide. So there is a sizable amount of ad spend and podcast interest and yeah. revenue outside the US that while Spotify is doing great worldwide, they are very US focused. While Acast is great everywhere, their app is now sunset. So you're in a unique position, and that's, that's pretty cool where we are in podcasting. Um, Ads are my favorite thing because I think that they're the worst and also the best. Uh, I came into advertising around the time that Mad Men was popular and I got to really fall in love with what you could do with advertising. Um, a lot of people in podcasting didn't. We've hired so many people recently. But advertising, if done right, is fun content. And in podcasting, unlike... Uh, you know, the expectations in perhaps radio, definitely TV, magazines, everything else, there's not as many cues that we've switched and it says, oh, here's a break, please excuse me, this is where we make money. So as we dig into advertising, Rebecca, like what are the, what are the challenges, like especially with, with how you're set up that make advertising a strong model, but you know, where does it fit in for you overall revenue-wise? No, it's a really good question. So one of the reasons I was brought into New York Public Radio is because I have a commercial advertising background. And New York Public Radio historically was incredibly conservative in terms of our approach to truly like commercial ads. And from a um, like regulation perspective, it's really just our terrestrial broadcast where we have to be careful about how our spots sound. We are, we're governed by FCC and FTC regulations. So because you know we're a nonprofit, um, FC, those are just like so we can't we cannot have a call to action in a radio ad, okay? So I'm like, how do you sell ads if they don't have a call <laughs> to action? That was my big thing. So why am I taking this job? But what you start to figure out is in the podcasting um, realm. Yes, we are still regulated by FTC regulations from an FCC perspective. We have a lot more flexibility. Um, legally, so it became a job of mine to convince the organization, which very much includes content, marketing, executive, board, stakeholders, hey, we're not breaking any laws, we can still have high quality, good sounding spots that do not, um, you know, trick the listeners, we're very cautious about, you know, we don't want to take advantage of listeners um, and make money, um, so we have 90 second custom content vignettes, you know, branded content. We do that on pod, no problem. In the terrestrial world, we um, was still very much within FTC and FCC guidelines, which I'm now very well versed in, despite never going to law school. Um, thank God, but anyway. Um, we have certain regulations and enhanced spots for certain verticals, like nonprofits. We're allowed to be a little bit easier there. And we're growing. I mean, because of this, because we still have very strict guidelines around how we want the spot to sound, or how we want the music bed to sound. Um, we've been able to be more flexible in working with our um, ad agency and direct clients to kind of give them what they want in an environment where their ads are actually listened to, their spots are actually listened to. So with public media, the listeners trust us because they're just, they rely on our content. They know it's um, the best quality journalism 
around, obviously I'm biased, but you know, the listeners believe sure. that. I'm quoting the listeners, not myself. <laughs> um, and they're like 73% more likely to you know, like a brand they hear on public media because they trust public media. They're 71% more, percent more likely to take action because of a spot they hear because they, of the environment of trust and also because they can hear the spot. So um, we're, we're, making it, we're figuring out ways to be a little bit more commercial while still um, maintaining our listeners and listener engagement and that sort of thing. And like we said, we differentiate advertising and sponsorship. Is it easier to sell sponsorship then? I mean, it, it's called work because it isn't easy, but um, <laughs> easier. Depends if you, it depends on the day that we talk to my sellers, right? So I think it depends. I think in, in many ways it's actually harder to sell sponsorship because more and more advertisers and brands, they're used to getting endorsement spots, right? They want the host to endorse their product. We just do not do endorsements. We don't because like, I'm not going to, like, it's not my decision. It's just like, it's just that what we, how we operate. Um, so that's hard because we're yeah. different and we have to constantly explain why we're different and how we're different, you want, but why it's so important. Podcasting hasn't really defined a lot of the ad formats. I mean, we have host read or announcer read for the creative aspect. We have baked in or dynamically inserted for the delivery, but there's no set time. We talk about 30, 60, 90 seconds, but there's, there's no, like, whether it's endorsed or not, there's no set pricing schedule, and we're trying to figure that out. And this is the challenges that come up because some of the people that we see leading the charge in advertising who've done so well, it's because they can just say, yep, we can do that. Sure, we'll take that contract. We'll do whatever to win this deal, and then we'll win the next one at a higher rate and go from there. Sometimes we have to hold a few different standards. And Rob, I mean, Libsyn predates dynamic ad insertion. And I think that Libsyn has done a killer job at you know, uh, offering and providing and encouraging people ways to do ad monetization even before AdvertiseCast came on board. And, and AdvertiseCast is, is very well known. I'm sure you guys work directly with AdvertiseCast as well. So what's, what's that like? Yeah, I mean, we've actually supported dynamic ad insertion at Libsyn since about 2006. So, yeah, then? so we've had it in our platform <laughs> for a very long time. Yeah. Um, the, the, the issue was for many years is that nobody used it. So we had it in there. There was maybe a few podcasters that were using dynamic ad insertion in the early days of the medium. But uh, it's only been probably, I think, since maybe 2013, 14, and when people really started to look at dynamic ad insertion as a viable method. The whole industry was basically run off of baked in host reads. I mean, that's, that's what everything was, was being done back then. It was only the leading edge companies that were using tech to, to do archival insertion and things like yeah. that. And certainly the, um, the programmatic side and the dynamic ad insertion stuff has definitely gotten more sophisticated um, with greater capabilities and now we've got um, controversies around attribution and and privacy and things like that where people have been trying to u utilize that technology to target the delivery of ads to segments of audience or segments of downloads uh, and that's been a controversial issue as well but uh, but certainly um, the technology aspect of it is is the strength of it I think where the struggle has been around is the ad creative um, you know, a lot of radio ads were getting funneled into the, the dynamic ad insertion campaigns, and that wasn't a compatible fit with um, podcasting. So yeah. I think we've seen definitely improvements in the ad creative um, that's being pumped into dynamic ad insertion campaigns that has really kind of elevated the, the opportunity. And, and I think you're right on the ad creative part because... Uh, Again, as we don't have a format, uh, Danny Murphy from ACAST did a phenomenal presentation. Please watch the recorded, if you miss it, from Sunday, uh, where she explained that there shouldn't be a script to the podcast ads because if you coach and you walk them through that and your goal is the endorsement, it can be really powerful. But that wouldn't work for your company, and it doesn't work for all, every company, right? They, they might not be able to carry the ad as well as they carry the show, so we're still figuring all that out. But this technology is really cool right now and it's very accessible and we're just as an industry haven't slowed down well enough to learn all the ins and outs of it and that's why you know i invite all of you to dig into podcasting more because if you sign up for any hot podcast hosting platform even yourself as a hobbyist 
you'll be able to use the tools that everybody on stage is using to some degree or another and really learn it and become an expert in it. Uh, Nikolaj, so in Podomo, like, there are, I can keep my ads if I go claim it on there. Yes. But now, for the shows that you create on there, do you sell ads into them? Nope. So the shows that are created just for you are exclusive? They're exclusive and they're ad-free. But of course, again, given the fact that we have a large number of other yeah. podcasts which are non-exclusive, um, they will come with the ads that they were born with. Now, and, uh, we do... I mean, we might here and there, we are testing it right now, actually, as we speak, um, insert some pre-rolls, mid-rolls, post-rolls, whatever, for own shows. Yeah. But we're very, very observant of not, you know, uh, disturbing the, the idea of the original and exclusive programming is ad-free. And I think that's smart because the flexibility is really important. We're seeing in streaming Netflix having sworn they were never going to do ads at their last earning call. They're like, maybe. <laughs> Maybe we're going to get ads in there. And you're not getting me to swear anything today. Well, good. No, I, but, I, but it's good that you're testing it. And yeah. you have an app and you have direct user feedback. And you'll be able to see that, right? And that's what we need to remember. Radio, I'm, I'm 36 years old. And my experience with radio is, you know, lots of ads in the U.S. Um, a lot of you not in the United States are very lucky uh, compared in your experience. But there's a lot of ads. And then we go to podcasting. And I have a young child and I listen to the podcast with and I will pick an ad-free feed. I will pay that extra to skip it because it's been, I've been able to avoid it. So giving the option to find it accessible, finding ads that are, that are worthwhile um, and that resonate well can be a good path, but it's also very clearly not a requirement. Um, we have very little time left, but I would love to see if we can get one or two questions if anybody has any. Anybody raise your hand if you have a question? No. Okay. Anything that the three of you would like to, to bring up as a last remark or? I, w I was expecting oh. some questions. Yeah. Well, we have, it looks like we got one. That was great. Let me grab this, Rob, and then, oh, if you want to grab it right there. Thank you. Hello. Um, I'm from the BBC, so we have a different interpretation of what advertising and things we can do in, within the UK particularly. And I guess as we start to think about our, our models outside the UK, one of the questions I had was, how do you consider, obviously we've looked about advertising and sponsorship, but cross-promotion, even of your own content, do you include that in your premium feeds, like a 30-second spot, say, for another title in your network? Yeah, yeah so we don't... Oh, I should be careful with how I say this because I'm on. Um, no one I work with is here, but you know, it's the, recorded. The, the internet. Um, <laughs> we don't consider internal cross promotion like advertising or sponsor. So we just um, and even in the premium, like the premium content, the subscription content that includes the ability to cross promote our other shows. So and. Nikolaj, and do you uh, yeah, that was exactly what I was saying before. That we are trying to cross promote some of our own shows, but we have, again we are very careful of not disturbing the ad free experience um, because we don't do know that we again we don't want to put too much strain on on the the uh, the notion of that we are actually in fact uh, ad free when it comes to the exclusive and original prog programming. Yeah, and to take another little twist on this, um, the cross promotion is. Um, the advertised cast platform is going to enable podcasters that host at Lipson to be able to run ad campaigns for their podcasts on other people's podcasts as a cross promotion. So there's a lot of experimentation in the industry right now, especially with some of the larger shows um, that are running ad campaigns, basically promoting their podcast on other similar podcasts. And it's a, it's a little bit of, a, of an art and science to, to kind of pull that off effectively um, to try and get matched up with the right show that you're going to cross promote on that, that doesn't damage the audience of the show that you're advertising on because you're driving audience away from that show, but to be complementary to, to the show as well as pick up um, basically adding listeners is what you're trying to do. Um, but there's been shows that have, you know, I know a couple shows that are, are spending tens of thousands of dollars a month 
running ad campaigns on certain select podcasts, and they're they're bringing in um, more ad revenue because of their increase in audience mm-hmm. size than it costs to run the campaign. So they're actually making money yeah. on doing this cross promotional effort. So Jordan Harbinger, uh, the Jordan Harbinger yeah, show, spends one hundred and fifty thousand dollars every month to promote his podcast. Uh, because the return from advertising from the additional inventory is worthwhile for them. I, I think for the BBC, the, my advice there is that uh, you know content. And so if the promo fits with the content that you want to put it in and you make it feel organic and part of it, then it works in that regard. But I, I think a lot of the, the technical side of it considers promo to not be an advertisement. It's, it would be like direct sold, second seat seller, promo at the bottom, and promo is meant to be the fallback when you don't have an ad, fill it with that. And, and I love that because I think treating the listener with respect and saying, hey, I'm going to have six ads in every episode. Well, I don't have them all sold right now, but here's some promos is a great way to keep them ready for that. It also depends on the CPM model that you're going to get out of those campaigns. So if, if the cross promotion is as much as a regular advertiser, then... I think in in-house yeah, is what... Right. Yeah. But just with the one thing I say about in-house, and this is just really in the weeds, depending on who your ad server is, there's a cost to it, right? So sometimes you just have to keep that in mind. We got one more question, and then uh, we're going to call. But the rest of us will stay around afterwards um, if anybody has any other questions. Coming up with the mic right now. Hi, my name is Rune. Uh, I used to work with uh, with the commercializing uh, podcast, and uh, at that point, I was uh, thinking a lot about uh, what's the breakage point? How many ads can you put in uh, without uh, disturbing anything? I, I, we all want to respect the listener and stuff like that, but I had a feeling that uh, we were actually being a little bit too too careful. That uh, that you know, one pre-roll and maybe uh, two mid-rolls was a little bit too careful. And so I would like to just ask the panel, those of you who do uh, advertising, if you have any idea, have you ever have you ever broken anything? That's the question. With ads. Well, well I can answer that a little bit. I I know that the Edison research has shown over the last couple of years uh, that there is an increasing audience sensitivity to ad load uh, that's already starting to happen, at least in the U.S. anyway. Um, so a certain so what's happening is a lot of the big shows are getting um, sold out, right? They're getting oversold, and that's putting pressure on those a lot, a lot of the bigger shows to add more spots, right? Because they want to make more money. So, so, and then a lot of the advertisers are putting a lot of their campaigns into a fairly small number of shows, and so that's just really putting a lot of pressure on those bigger shows to increase their inventory. Um, this is driving this this metric that's coming out of the Edison research is showing that audiences are getting a little overloaded. And yeah. so, so I, I think the answer to this is to, is to maybe um, get advertising agencies to buy across larger numbers of shows instead of putting so much pressure on these big shows and, um, and overloading them. My last point with that, we don't know because there's so many scenarios where you can't, and can't break it. Um, but I think if you look closely enough, there are some networks, big networks, that have broken it. And, well, uh, not if you keep releasing more episodes per week. There are ways around it, and there are ways to get more inventory. And if you look closely, people are struggling with these, and they're not looking at the numbers, because unfortunately right now, there are some big companies that their margin focus has been in the wrong direction. And I think we're going to see some changes related to that in the near future. Um, but yeah, I think I think ads have to be content in podcasting. They are part of your show, and that's what matters. And every show can be different. Thank all of you so much for coming here. It was great speaking to all of you. And I hope to see you next year.